All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kel. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 29, The Chemicals of the Tua de Danin. So the Tua de Danin are a mythological race of quote-unquote gods that once inhabited ancient Ireland, and they are reported to have been experts in the practice of magic. Well, we all know from our previous discussions that the magic of these ancient civilizations was in fact a practical knowledge of chemistry. So in today's episode, we're going to be discussing two significant chemicals, that I propose were being produced on an industrial scale by this mysterious ancient race of being. That is it for the intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go with tonight's episode. So the Tua de Danin are this mythological race of beings that once inhabited ancient Ireland. And according to the mythology, they are directly associated with the ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland, such as Newgrange, Carrow Keel, etc. So the mythology of ancient Ireland states that these structures are not burial sites, but rather they are the dwelling places of these magical gods. For example, Newgrange is directly associated as being the dwelling place of the Dagda, one of the chief sorcerers and magicians of the Tua de Danon. So we know, again, from our previous discussions, that the magic of these civilizations was, in fact, chemistry. So what exactly were they doing inside of these ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland? Well, in my previous episode entitled The Function of Newgrange and the Passage Chamber Structures of Ireland, I go into great detail describing exactly how Newgrange and these ancient stone and earth mound structures were utilized to produce a chemical called ferrous sulfate. And I'm going to insert a video here in just a moment that shows that reaction process underway. Preparation of ferrous sulfate or green vitriol, FeSO4 7H2O. Commercially, it is prepared by the slow oxidation of marcasite FeS2 by air in presence of water. 2FeS2-7O2 and 2H2O gives 2FeSO4 and 2H2SO4. Marcasite is staked in heaps and exposed to moist air for several days and then leached with water. From the resulting solution, crystals of beta sulfate are obtained by filtering and evaporating the solution. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is your product, green vitriol, otherwise known as crystalline ferrous sulfate, chemical compound FeSO4. You may be asking yourself, for what applications were they using this beautiful green crystalline chemical? Well, here's your answer. Ferrous sulfate is a ubiquitously useful chemical that would have had a multitude of different applications for a society that was utilizing chemistry in an attempt to reestablish their civilization after the catastrophe that ended the last ice age. So they were using chemicals that were going to be beneficial to their civilization as they reestablish themselves in their new homelands. So the first two uses for this ferrous sulfate are for the production of iron metal and sulfuric acid. So if you take that crystalline ferrous sulfate and dissolve it into water, you can produce a ferrous sulfate solution. That solution can then be distilled, which is going to release the sulfur oxide vapors from the solution. Again, that chemical compound is FeSO4. So you have a sulfur oxide compound attached to your iron element. So again, that distillation process releases those sulfur oxides. Those sulfur oxides can then be dissolved into water to produce sulfuric acid. After that process is complete, all of the sulfur oxides have been distilled off and all of the water has been distilled off. That will leave a deposit of iron oxide in the bottom of your beaker. That iron oxide can then be smelted to produce iron metal. So certainly two very, very useful applications for this ferrous sulfate compound. 
So the third use for the ferrous sulfate is going to be in regard to its medicinal properties. Ferrous sulfate contains iron and is completely non-toxic. So it is very, very effective for treating anemia and iron deficiencies in the human body. The fourth use is going to be in the dye and textile industry. Ferrous sulfate is used as a dye fixative to help make sure that your dyes adhere to the textile that are being colored. The fifth application is going to be for a soil conditioner for plant growth. Ferrous sulfate is still used today as a soil conditioner, and it helps to adjust the pH of the soil to facilitate plant growth. The sixth application for the ferrous sulfate is going to be for wastewater treatment. Ferrous sulfate acts as a coagulant, and it facilitates the accumulation and cohesion of the solid particles that are contaminating your water. The seventh and possibly the most important utilization for the ferrous sulfate is for the precipitation of metallic gold from an auric chloride solution. So we know that gold can be dissolved into a solution of nitric and hydrochloric acids, and you can then precipitate that gold out of the solution by utilizing ferrous sulfate. We know that the production of gold was one of the most important undertakings for these ancient civilizations. And you would certainly need a compound to precipitate out that dissolved gold once it has been dissolved in those acidic solutions. So those, ladies and gentlemen, are the seven basic applications for the ferrous sulfate that was being produced in the ancient passage chamber structures of Ireland by the Tuatha all right, ladies and gentlemen, up next on tonight's episode, we are going to be discussing phosphorus. So for those of you that are not familiar with this element, its properties or its capabilities, I'm going to insert a couple of videos here that give you a little background on exactly how this element operates. Links in the video description below. A piece of white phosphorus is dried and placed in the glass deflagrating spoon. The element is lowered quickly into a flask of oxygen. White phosphorus is stored under water because it is spontaneously flammable in air. The element soon ignites and burns vigorously in the oxygen. This reaction is often referred to as the phosphorus sun. Phosphorus is an element that can come in a few different forms. One of the most reactive forms is white phosphorus, and a while ago, I was able to get some chunks of it. It's stored underwater to protect it from air, and the moment I take it out, it starts smoking. This is because it's reacting with oxygen and letting off phosphorus oxides. It's often used to make large amounts of smoke, but it's also sometimes used as a weapon, which is a bit terrifying. This is because white phosphorus is not only very toxic, it's also super hard to put out when it's on fire. To test this, I'm just gonna light this small piece. It immediately starts burning and splashing, but I can put it out by just smothering it, which makes it seem not that bad. However, because it's so reactive with air, this is what happens when I take away the dish. All right, so now that you have seen exactly how this element phosphorus behaves, let's now talk about one of the mythological weapons of the Tuatadanan, which is an instrument called the Spear of Lu. So according to the Irish mythology describing this weapon, the Spear of Lu was said to be impossible to overcome. Its tip had to be kept immersed in a pot of water to keep it from igniting, and the spear was called a slaughterer in translation. So you can certainly see why I believe that this weapon was actually a weapon containing phosphorus. The description that is contained in the mythology of ancient Ireland exactly describes the behaviors, properties, and capabilities of phosphorus when applied as a weapon. You can see here the mythology also describes it as symbolic of a lightning weapon. So you can see as that phosphorus in the video begins to react with the oxygen in the air, it's sparking and producing lights. So you can certainly see the relationship between the description of it being a lightning weapon and the knowledge of elemental phosphorus that we have today, the ancient Tuatadanan were extracting phosphorus and they were utilizing this compound as a weapon in battle. This has been clearly described in all of the mythology. And if you take a moment to evaluate these stories from the perspective of chemistry, you can retrieve some truth from this mythology. So the spear itself was said to need no wielding, that it was alive and it thirsted for blood, 
that only by stepping its head in a sleeping drought of pounded fresh poppy leaves could be keep it at rest. So you saw that in the video that once the combustion of phosphorus has begun, it is almost impossible to put this thing out. And that is exactly what they're describing here in the mythology describing the weapon. They also say that the weapon itself roared and struggled against its thongs. Fire flashed from it and it tore through the ranks of the enemy, never tiring of slaying. So you can see exactly how this description included in the mythology of the Tuatodonon is perfectly describing phosphorus utilized as a weapon. So that, of course, begs the question, how exactly were the Tuatodonon producing this phosphorus? Well, I wanted to give you some background on the production and extraction of the element phosphorus because it is not an easy element to obtain. It requires an intensely laborious chemical extraction process to obtain this phosphorus. So the first protocol for the extraction of phosphorus originally involved letting urine stand for days until it gave off a terrible smell. They then boiled down that urine to a paste, heated the paste to a high temperature, led vapors through the water, and through that extraction process, they eventually obtained a white waxy substance that glowed in the dark, otherwise known as phosphorus. So it took approximately 1,100 liters, almost 300 gallons of urine to make approximately 60 grams of phosphorus. And of course, later scientists discovered that you don't need to let the urine rot to extract the phosphorus. Urine contains phosphorus regardless. So again, you can see that it is an incredibly laborious chemical extraction to obtain phosphorus. So if the Tuatodonon were utilizing phosphorus as a weapon, they certainly would have been producing that compound on a semi-industrial scale. So of course, the boiling and heating of the urine extract certainly doesn't seem like the most effective way to obtain that chemical, but nonetheless, it requires intensely laborious chemistry to extract this compound. So the second process for the extraction of elemental phosphorus involves bone ash, and there's two different methods that could be applied. You could first calcine your bones and then distill them to release your phosphorus product. Or secondly, you could also precipitate out phosphates by grinding up and calcining your bones and then washing them with strong acids. We know from the previous slides that ferrous sulfate can be utilized to produce sulfuric acid, which can then be reacted with salt to produce hydrochloric acid. This civilization certainly would have had access to acidic solutions. So this is the method that I suggest was being utilized by the Tuatodonon for the production of this elemental phosphorus. But you can see that this itself is also a very complicated and laborious chemical extraction, not something that just happens accidentally. And this is a clear indication that this civilization was in possession of a practical knowledge of chemistry. Now, the third methodology for the extraction of elemental phosphorus, which is still in use today, is to use an electric arc furnace to extract phosphorus from phosphate rock. Now, I'm certainly not applying that the ancient Tuatodonon, these mythological inhabitor gods of Ireland, were in possession of electric arc furnaces. So I do suggest that this bone ash acidic extraction process is most likely the chemical extraction that they were utilizing for the production of phosphorus that was utilized in the weapons such as the Spear of Lou. So ladies and gentlemen, these two chemicals, ferrous sulfate and phosphorus, were two of the chemicals that were being produced by this mythological race of inhabitor gods, the Tuatodonon, that once settled in ancient Ireland. There is a whole lot more to this story to be told, so just stay tuned. And just a quick reminder that limited first edition print copies of the Land of Chem book are now available at thelandofchem.com. So if you want to help support the channel, just go to the website. You can pick up a copy of the book, grab yourself a t-shirt. Either way, all of the orders mean more to me than words can possibly ever describe. So I will simply say thank you. All right, everyone, that is it for tonight's video. This was episode 29, The Chemicals of the Tua de Donan. I really hope you enjoyed tonight's video. I have some absolute bangers coming up for the next several episodes here on the Land of Chem YouTube channel. As the story continues to unfold, these videos will get more and more interesting. So just stay tuned. 
a quick thank you to all of the new subscribers here on the Land of Chem YouTube channel. If you like the video, leave it a like. If you haven't already, subscribe to the Land of Chem and click that little notification bell so that you get noticed whenever these videos premiere. Leave me a comment in the comment section below. I really enjoy hearing what everybody thinks about these videos. If you want to help support the channel, www.thelandofchem.com if you want to pick up a copy of the book. I think that is it for tonight's episode, so I will see you next time.